Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm Jennifer West. I'm the program director of the MFA Art. Um, and this is the last lecture of the season. We'd like to highlight for any outside guests that we have a great lineup starting next January, and we look forward to seeing you back. Um, that's going to include Mackenzie Bork in, con uh, in conversation with our own Madison Moore, as well as Genevieve Gagnard, an um, artist from San Francisco, Claire Kim from MoCA, and Aurora Tang, to name a few. We look forward to seeing you then. So I'm going to turn it over to Amelia <coughs> I'm very excited. So I'm speaking just very briefly before Sophie and Hattie give a more proper introduction. I, Amelia Jones, I'm the chair of critical studies and a big performance studies fan and person. And I nominated Martin as a Rusty Talk speaker because um, I thought that not only are you an amazing performer, who has performed with, um, actually in Los Angeles, with Sherry Rose, who's a legendary performance goddess. Um, but also Martin teaches performance and can, I think, be a great um, contributor to our conversations around our own performance studies graduate certificate. So um, super excited to have you here, Martin. And I did want to mention that Martin is actually performing with Sherry this Saturday from 2 to 8 p.m. because it's never enough time. You gotta, you gotta like go long durations to make everyone experience it. Um, and that will be at Last Projects, which is an independent gallery at 206 South Avenue 20. If you didn't get that, just email me and I'll send you the info. And with that, Sophie and Hattie. Hello, everyone. Um, again, we're all very excited to welcome Martin O'Brien, um, English performance artist and scholar whose practice and research focuses on the representation of illness and disability in performance. Having earned an MA in performance from Aberystwyth University and a practice-based PhD from the University of Reading, O'Brien has published work in Contemporary Theater Review and Dance Theater Journal, and in 2014 edited a special edition of Performance Research. O'Brien's critically acclaimed book, Survival of the Sickest, was published in 2018, marking over 10 years of his art and writing. Additionally, the artist's work has been commissioned and funded by organiza organizations such as Live Art Development Agency, Arts Council England, British Council, and Arts Catalyst, and has been features on BBC Radio and Sky Television. In 2021, O'Brien was the recipient of the Philip, the Philip Lieberhulme Prize for Visual and Performing Arts, and is currently a senior lecturer in live art at Queen Mary University of London. And now, here's Sophie with more. O'Brien's artistic and academic work utilizes autoethnography as a methodology to understand illness and mortality, analyzing death, dying, objection, medicine, pain, the queer body, and BDSM through the lens of live performance, endurance, and durational art. Emerging from his own personal experiences with illness, O'Brien has performed throughout the UK, Europe, and North America, including Spill Festival, Abrams Art Center, and One National Gay and Lesbian Archives in Los Angeles. Recent major shows include The Last Breath Society, Coffin Coffin, at ICA London, and Until the Last Breath is Breathed at the Tate Britain. In 2023, he will be the artist writer in residence at Whitechapel Gallery in London, and in Los Angeles, he will be part of Rose's Wake with Sherry Rose this month at Last Projects, as Professor Amelia Jones mentioned. Um, so thank you, Martin, for being here. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me. 
it's so nice to be here in Los Angeles with you all tonight. Thanks for braving the rain as well. Um, the last two days, my dates have been dropping like flies, going, oh, I'm so sorry, but it's raining, you know, and it's just cold, and it's, it's wet, and I feel like I should just stay inside. You know, I just need to rest. That's what I need to do. I just need to rest. Um, you know, and I came over, getting on the plane from London, thinking, great, November in Los Angeles. That's exactly what I like, the sun, a bit of warmth. You know, I came with my shorts, one pair of trousers. My friend said, bring a pair of trousers just for the evenings. It might be a little chilly. And then I arrived, and so far it's like being in London. Um, and I already started getting spooky. Um, great, so today's lecture is going to be in three parts. Um, the first part is called Durations of Death and Dying. The second part is called The Coffin and Coffin. And the third part is called Ghosts. Holding a hammer in one hand, I swing it upwards. It crashes against the wooden lid above me. I slam again and again, it's hot in here, and I'm covered in sweat. I lay thinking I'm gonna need a different approach. I'm sealed inside a coffin, trying to break my way out with a hammer, a saw, and a series of strange metal rods that probably have a name that I've never heard of. It sounds like a nightmare or some sort of scene from a horror movie. movie. It's neither. Instead, it's the opening of my eight-day performance installation at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, the last breath society, Coffin Coffin. The installation consists of a series of wooden coffins which I perform in, around, on top of, during the duration of the exhibition and performance. They're stacked, moved, pushed around, and around the perimeter of the space, there are ten video monitors. Each one with a video commissioned by another artist, Franco B, Rossi Bolivar, Shabnam Shabatsi, Anselman Biswas, Keir O'Reilly, Let the Virgin Tremavisto, Joseph Morgan Schofield, Shuri Rose, Nick T, Naomi Lachmeyer. I first imagined this performance installation before the pandemic was even an apple in any of our eyes. The idea of a series of coffins from within them, the sound of coughing. <coughs> and in my northern accent, hey, welcome everyone, coming in. And in my northern accent, the, the, the word coffin, as in the thing you're sealed in when you're dead, and coffin, the thing that you do when you cough, <coughs> kind of sound the same, and that was part of the joke. But the, the thought of the sound of the cough coming out of the coffin was where it originated. Um, and that was not very different from my practice in a way. It moved on from a lot of the stuff that I've been thinking about. So my work has always dealt with death and dying. I have a disease called cystic fibrosis. Um, and the disease is one which affects the lungs. So I've always used the, the sound of the cough as a material in my practice. So to return to that, and to think about, okay, making this installation using a series of coffins with the cough coming out of them was the beginning of something. And then all of a sudden, the work was disrupted. Uh, the work couldn't happen for about two years and the pandemic came upon us. And then returning to it, I went, oh, the cough has a different meaning now. It's changed. It's, it's something that it didn't used to be, the sound of the cough and the image of the coffin as well, the thing that you're buried in feels like it all of a sudden has a different cultural meaning. Um, and so the work became a way of trying to think through and deal with what does it mean to be sick and dying during a time where everybody is thinking about illness and death, where even the healthy are having to think about what it means to be mortal, about what it means for those closest to them to be dying, for themselves to be dying. What does death now mean? during this time of a pandemic. And in a way, this, this lecture tonight is thinking about my work in relation to 
this lingering pandemic, to the kind of politics of the pandemic, and to like rethink what does it may mean to make art during a time of illness, and what does it mean to make art about illness during a time of illness. A woman tells her son to sit quietly. She tells him that he only has a certain number of breaths, and when he's used them all, he'll die. The child spends the next few hours sat holding his breath for as long as possible. He wants to preserve his life for as many years as he can. He hopes that he might never die. He hopes he might find a way to hold his breath for such a long period of time that the end will never come. The boy goes into training. Each day he holds his breath for longer and longer. He grows into a young man and he still practices his breath holding. He becomes a free diver, swimming under the sea with no oxygen. This helps him to spend extended periods of time without breathing. His life goes on. His only thought is to extend life through holding his breath. He remains silent for most of his life. He only speaks when he really needs to. He spends most of his time alone or standing quietly in the company of others. The man is pretty, but he never takes a sexual partner. He hears that sex makes breathing heavy, something to be avoided at all costs. He listens to music, music and pities the singers, surely this can't be good for their health. He's particularly disturbed by songs that use whistling, a terrible, terrible waste of breath. Swimming under the water is his only pleasure. He swims near the sharks, marveling at their power, their speed and their beauty. He's particularly fascinated by the white pointer or the great white as they are commonly known. He watches as it moves. The pointer must continually move forward, swim forward in order to survive. It can only breathe when water is running through its gills. The man wonders if the sharks too have a certain number of breaths. He wonders if they are conscious that their life depends upon movement forward. One day, the man goes out to dive. He climbs off the boat. The water is calm. In the distance, you can see the fin of a shark cutting through the water as if it was a surgeon's scalpel cutting through a human lung. It moves rapidly towards him and then vanishes underneath. He knows what this means as pointers always attack from below. He turns towards the boat, but it's too late. He feels a great force from below, and the water turns red. He's dragged under the surface. The shark vanishes as quickly as it arrived. They do not like the taste of human flesh. This was a mistaken attack. The man surfaces, his head above the water. He opens his mouth, and for the first time since he was a small child, he screams. The breath forces its way out of his body. It's exhilarating. He screams again and again. All of his energy goes into the scream. He's out of breath, but continues to scream in a mixture of agony and pure pleasure. And then he passes out. The blood was running from his leg, and he starts to sink. His mouth wide open in a frozen scream. He continues to sink. The water rushes into his mouth and begins to fill his lungs. He coughs, inhales, exhales, breathes. He is breathing in the water. In this moment, he realizes that his life had been for nothing. All this saving breath, it led not to immortality, but to this moment, this moment of drowning. As he breathes in the water, he feels alive for the first time. He imagines that he too is a white pointer. He imagines that he needed to move forward in order to breathe in the water. He imagines that the water that is killing him is actually sustaining him. He imagines that the blood is not his own, but a seal he has bitten. This is perhaps the happiest moment of his life. His body stiffens and his heart stops beating. The water continues to enter his body and he sinks further and further down. The corpse sinks forever. It never reaches the bottom. The salt maintains the flesh for longer. Small parasites feed on his slowly decaying body. The death of one sustains the life of others. The creatures in the deep ocean are able to continue breathing because of his body. The shark that caused this event continues swimming. It glides effortless, effortlessly through the water, always maintaining its forward motion always pushing the water through its gills, always breathing until the last breath is breathed. The corpses are strewn across the landscape. 
a great rumbling is felt in the cities and the towns. Something important is happening. In the church, the ceiling begins to fall on the worshippers. In the morgue, the bodies start to convulse. People feel it in their bones. The end is nigh. A group of people gather together to breathe together, to moan their own life and to rehearse for the inevitable. They are the last breath society, a place where mortals can gather and decay together. We all know the last breath. It's in our lungs. We haven't felt it yet. None of us here have felt the air move through our throats for the final time, but we all will. We know what it feels like somehow because we know what it is to breathe. In the final moments of life, something known as the death rattle occurs. The person is unable to cough or clear their throat, so the mucus builds up. Breathing is transformed. Each breath sounds crackling, wet. Fluids begin to build up in the chest and the throat. Then eventually comes the last breath, the final moment of life and consciousness. The lungs empty of all air. There is no final inhale of breath, just an agonizing silence. In the end, the flesh cannot resist the allure of decay. <coughs> Growing up with cystic fibrosis means a constant facing of your own mortality. My older cousin died from the disease aged 12 when I was eight. This was the first time I understood death as part of life. This was the first time I understood existence under the temporality of disease. This was the first time I knew I would not see, I would not live to see my hair turn grey. The life expectancy for someone born in 1987 with cystic fibrosis is 30 years old. This information was plastered all over the charity appeals as I grew up. I was sure I would die at 30. The temple movement towards this age was the defining condition of growing up for me. Death was an obsession. I reached and surpassed 30. Death did not come for me. In, for, in trying to understand what it means to live longer than expected, I formulated this idea of zombie time. Zombie time is the temple experience of living on when death is supposed to have happened. Zombie time is a different relationship to death and life. It's a form of enduring life when death is no longer the certainty it once was. It's no longer linear. It's full of breaks and ambushes. In zombie time, you keep moving, but not towards anything, just for the sake of moving. No goals, only desires. No plans, only reactions. The only constant is the presence of death, but not in the way it once was. For the zombie knows death and breathes in death. Death is in me instead of somewhere else. Zombie time offered me a way of conceptualizing a change in relationship to mortality. The temporal experience in my childhood and early adulthood was one of moving towards a death day. Zombie time, though, insists on a different temporal proximity. Like the Hollywood zombie, which holds within it a paradox that it's both dead and alive, those of us living in zombie time experience death as embodied in life. We have come to terms with the fact that we we're about to die and then we didn't. This necessitates a fundamental change in how we imagine death and our position in relation to it. Michel Foucault once said that the sick living body is the anticipation of the corpse it will become. Perhaps, though, zombie time offers us a way of thinking about sick, sick life. Uh, sorry, perhaps though, zombie time offers us a way of conceptualizing sick life not as the anticipation, but as already a corpse, one with new life breathed in it. The end of life is now ambiguous. Death is keenly felt as lived experience, but not as something in an imagined future, rather something that we're living through. There is no Grim Reaper anymore. Death is not external, but exists within you as the experience of life. And I've been thinking about the temporal experience of living during this pandemic, and that maybe in some way this is something similar to the idea of zombie time in that it necessitates a fundamental change in how we imagine sickness and mortality and how everybody is, or a large portion of the population is anyway. The virus means that the previously healthy are thrust into a contiguity with sickness and death. 
the means that are face to face, forced to face their own mortality. Zombie time helped me understand my own experience of temporality and the way in which death functioned as part of life. It offered an articulation of something that I couldn't find elsewhere. Perhaps it might be useful for trying to describe the temporality of the pandemic and the ways in which people have been forced to become acutely aware of death as part of their own life. The last breath, society, coughing, coughing. In a way, is like a lot of my practice. My workers consistently use the materiality of my disease, breath, mucus, coughing, to explore what it means to be born with a life-shortening illness. I have often on, insisted on the isolation of dying young as a lonely process, as one which renders a person outside of the dominant experiences of life. Indeed, the experience of cystic fibrosis can be solitary. Those of us with the disease are unable to be in a room with anyone else who shares the same condition. We must remain six feet apart from one another when outdoors. Those of us who best understand the feelings of cystic fibrosis are unable to be together. Unable to touch, unable to hug, unable to kiss or fuck. But my feelings about loneliness of dying are changing. The Last Breath Society in some ways was a gathering of a horde. The Last Breath Society is a semi-fictional group. It's a gathering of those of us living in zombie time and others who are forced to think about what death is because of the proximity to it. Perhaps now, my neighbours and co-workers should all be part of the society. Perhaps now, the politicians who underfunded our health services and the footballers should join the society. Perhaps now, the doctors and the post people, the nurses and the drag queens, the police and the deep sea divers should all be part of the society. The explorers and the singers, the cleaners and the stadium announcers should join the society. The young should join the old and the last breath society now. Perhaps you should be part of the society too. The grim reaper stands outside all of your doors now and there is no way to ignore the knocking. His skeletal face peers through your window and watches you sleep and it's terrifying. He has become a good friend to me, but a friend that will one day betray me. I know not to trust him. As an artist, my work has often imagined worlds in which only the sick can survive. My film, made in collaboration with Sahel Merchant, The Unwell, shot in 2015 and first shown in 2016, it's set in a city in which it's always night. Human life has been replaced by creatures called the Unwell. These are B-movie style zombies and are always seen alone. I play all of them. Staggering through an empty city, coffin. The opening of the film is a series of empty streets, roads and buildings at night. Watching it back during the first lockdown seemed eerie. As, as I looked out of the window at the empty streets of London, the film, the film seems to imagine a, a new form of life. We never see how the city became overrun by these unwell zombies, just the aftermath. As such, very little happens. The film uses the aesthetics of a dystopian apocalypse. Now though, during those uh, lockdowns, there's a kind of strange relevance as I looked out the window and saw the empty streets and imagined, what if, what if this is the beginning of the unwell taking over? This city is 
full of places where flowers don't grow. Gravel and dirt places, underpasses, places that look as though they come straight from a horizon. Places that are always empty, places that seem to be able to walk through at night. Places you would never take a first date. Long passages, tunnels, no places, dilapidated places. Places where you would expect to be taken by a murderer. have this dream. Well, it's a daydream actually. This one comes over me on a regular basis. It starts back in Burnley, a small poor industrial town in the northwest of England where I grew up. I used to live in a working class area, but only 15 minutes walk from my house. There were bigger houses with stables and horses. Beyond the big houses and the stables and the horses was a meadow. It was idyllic. In the summer, the grass was green, the trees were standing tall and mighty. It was vast and sloped slightly. The river powered through it, and it was always so quiet. I always imagined that no one other than me knew about it. I'd walk there as a shortcut to my grandma's house and sit for a little bit on the river bank, or take boys to make out with. The daydream starts with the river. I'm not even in it. It's just the imagery. But instead of water flowing through the meadow, it's mucus. There's a river of phlegm oozing and bubbling through the beauty of the countryside. It moves slowly. It's thick, green, and sticky. It's full of disease and bacteria, and the smell is unbearable. I'm not sure if anyone here knows what phlegm smells like. In small quantities, it's musty and bodily. It's not as strong as shit, but it's much, much worse. The river produces such a smell that people avoid this pretty little meadow. The smell travels so far that the people living in the big houses vomit on a regular basis and the horses won't leave the stables to be ridden. Some brave children still try to use the tree swing over the river, having become accustomed to the smell. Maybe they have CF too. But where once a child's feet skimmed along the surface of the water, now their foot sticks to the surface, dragging them from the swing and into the phlegm. For a few seconds, they manage to keep their head above the mucus, screaming and coughing, but are unable to free themselves from the sticky substance and eventually vanish underneath, never to be seen again. The daydream doesn't stop here. People in their homes turn on the taps to wash their pots and pans, but instead of water, mucus plops out. It sticks to the drains and blocks them. I've had several real-life drain blockages from mucus. People go to shower and the vile substance sprays and squirts from the head of the shower all over their naked bodies. No one can wash and no one can drink water. They are dirty all of the time. They are thirsty all of the time. When it rains, everyone runs for cover because falling from the sky are blobs of phlegm. It rains down for days and covers the pavements and the roads. It never goes away because there's nothing to wash it with. People trod on it and they're stuck until the fire brigade comes to rescue them. It dries in the summer and everywhere smells like mucus. Everyone starts to cough all the time. People try to stay indoors as much as possible. The vegetables and the fresh food in the shops become germ-ridden and inedible. No one can boil everything, so people have to eat dried and tinned food. Everyone feels worse because of their diets. People die and are buried, but they can't be washed, but the germs soon spread through the soil, killing plants and animals. The world is collapsing, but people are still reproducing, and at an even greater rate. As they're staying indoors as much as possible, they spend their time fucking. Babies are born and very rarely survive past a few weeks because the environment is so toxic. The positive side to this is that because there's so much pregnancy, people are able to suckle on each other's breasts to quench their thirst, as many people are lactating. Big corporations soon catch on to this though and start to pay people to lactate on massive factories where they bottle up the liquid and sell it for extortionate prices that only the rich can afford. 
Most animals are extinct and the human race is slowly following. The ocean is green with mucus too. No one goes sailing anymore and the mass of ships can be seen sticking out of the phlegm. No one dares to go surfing and the beaches become wastelands of dried mucus and sand where the fin of a shark could once be seen cutting through the water. Now the fin is stationary, stuck in place and rotting. As the world's food supply runs out, people begin turning on each other. The only food is the dirty flesh of other humans. Everyone is suspicious of everyone else. Humans hunt each other. Everyone is predator and everyone is prey. The suicide rate rises exponentially and the houses are full of blood, corpses and rotting flesh. Maggots are one of the few animals profiting from this and the world becomes overpopulated by flies. There is no police and no fire brigade anymore. The hospitals no longer function and the pharmacists run out of medicine. But there are some who thrive in such circumstances. There are some who walk the streets breathing in the bacteria-filled air. They are used to the mucus. They are used to the sickness. They are used to the death. They are the unwell. They stand on two feet and wear our clothes, but they are not us. Do they eat and sleep? Do they dream or even recognize their own reflections? Their actions seem to serve no purpose. They amble through this urban wasteland, coughing and spluttering. Their steps are labored and clumsy. Their garments are covered in blood and their faces have great wounds. And then their eyes, they witness, but they do not comprehend. They are blank and without personality. The empty eyes gaze straight ahead, but towards what future? What do they remember? Their coughs ring out all over the city. These bodies are like factories mass producing mucus. They seem to breathe, but we do not know if their hearts beat. Do they have the capacity to learn, to feel emotions? The only thing we can be sure of is that they are profoundly unwell. Someone with cystic fibrosis, I've coughed all my life. Although my regular coughing fits have often caused worry in public places, never as much as emerging from the lockdowns in London. As one of the most common symptoms of COVID, a focus on the cough seems to be one of the enduring legacies of the pandemic. Simon Bailey has suggested that the cough is the creature voiced. Stephen Connor says that the cough is the voice coerced by breath. And David Applebaum suggests that a cough is the detonation of the voice. If though the cough is a kind of detonation of voice, it's also the forceful establishment of a different voice, one that does not adhere to language, the voice of illness. The cough interrupts. It's something that cannot be contained and demands its right to be heard. It functions as a disordering of the voice and of the breath. Zombie time is constantly ruptured by the excessiveness of coughing fits. They function as markers of sickness, the cough, something to be avoided. As it reminds us of the potential of death within life, the sound of the cough seems to initiate our deepest bodily identifications. It's as if the cough speaks directly to the flesh of others, like a warning sign, triggering bodily memories of illness. Somehow, in the sound of the cough, lies the memory of death. The cough is an opening into zombie time. It ruptures our stable temporal experiences and thrusts us into a peculiar shadow temporality of the undead. For someone with cystic fibrosis, the cough has always also been a mark of identity. I can recognize a cystic fibrosis cough anywhere. It's raspy, moist, phlegm filled. The sound vibrates through the floor. The cough of another CF sufferer has a strange impact, a sense of a shared experience with another, but also a fear. This cough could make me very ill. But during the height of COVID, and still now, as we move around with the virus still spreading, the cough represents the virus and acts as a reminder of mortality, not just for the cougher, but for all who hear it too. The cough is now synonymous with the virus. Before the vaccine, it was a reminder of the, straight, uh, of the dangers of outdoors, of surfaces, and more significantly, the dangers of other humans. 
Your own death is potentially in the lungs of another. The copper holds your mortality in their chest and you hold theirs in yours. In the last breath society, cough and coughing, people enter into a dark space and are free to move around the perimeter. In the center of the space, a series of coffins closed, laying on the ground. From within them, the sound of coughing, recorded on tape recorders throughout the eight day duration of the installation, emerges. The coffins are sealed shut and the bodies are inside. In this instance, though, the cough serves as a confirmation of life. The corpse does not cough after all. If the coffin body acts as a mental mori, it also acts as a reminder of breath and of life. The Last Breath Society is about coming together to remember we'll die, but also a celebration of life, a defiant gathering for the sake of survival. In both CF and in COVID, closeness is prohibited too. Over the last 20 years or so, research into cross-infection and cystic fibrosis has meant that we should avoid anyone else with the disease. All cultural representations of cystic fibrosis have focused on this aspect as well. There's an episode of Grey's Anatomy, for example, based on a patient with cystic fibrosis. He's a young man who comes into hospital for a lung transplant. The doctors soon discover his girlfriend also has the disease, and they say that, he, that they will not perform the lung transplant unless he breaks up with his girlfriend, as they would be wasting the lungs. In 2019, Hollywood did CF with the film Five Feet Apart. It was the story of two CF sufferers who fall in love and break the six feet apart rule by stealing a foot. These two soppy examples of romantic versions of sickness and the tragedy of separation. However, they do highlight something significant. Something about these characters wanting to find connection with someone like them. These diseases prevent them from having a physical relationship. I remember in my own childhood, before cross-infection was discovered, playing with the other kids with cystic fibrosis in the hospital, there's a kind of comfort in being around others that understand. The implication of our inability to be together is that in our violent coughs, there exists a potential of harm towards another. On our fingertips and in our breath, there exists bacteria that might make someone else ill. In staying away, we're helping someone else, but also helping ourselves. Physical closeness is craved, but dangerous. During the lockdowns, all of us longed to be together with friends and loved ones, but the closeness we desired was not simply a danger to ourselves, but to a population as well. How can we be together when we cannot be together? The multitude of online options cannot replace touch or closeness. We are united through a temporal experience, but we can't form important and necessary friendships. Our bodies which are failing are left to do so alone. The people we worry about as the virus spread were disembodied voices on the end of a phone. What we would give to hold the people we love now, what we would give to love the people that share our experience. The part goes. This is 
bit where I wanted to talk a little bit uh, more normally, no reading. Um, and I wanted to think about, because I was in LA, about the, the things that ghost and have moved through my practice. Um, one of those being this city, really, and a kind of history of art and performance that's happened in this city. Uh, and particularly one duo of artists who many of you probably would have heard of, which was uh, Bob Flanagan and Cherie Rose, who were LA legends. And Bob Flanagan died from the disease from cystic fibrosis in 1996. And he lived a full-time BDSM relationship with his partner, Cherie Rose, uh, where he was the submissive and she was the mistress. Uh, it was a full-time lifestyle as well as infiltrating into their art practices and using BDSM as a way to think through the politics of love, um, the politics of death, the politics of companionship. Um, and so it was life, practice, art practice, all of those things molded together. And over the last 12 years, um, I started a collaboration with Cherie Rose, who is now 81, and still living here in Los Angeles. And um, Cherie was going to be here tonight, actually, and I was going to invite her up for this bit, and we would do a little um, double act. And then, you know, she was going to be able to call me, oh, honey, I, I just don't know if I can get there. It's so rainy outside. <laughs> Um, so she isn't here, but she's the ghost of Cherie is here. And we'll be performing together on Saturday. Uh, <coughs> and our, our collaboration started with this action. It was very short action um, in 2011. We did this performance. A 15 minute work called 100 Reasons, which was based on a piece that Bob and Cherie had made in collaboration with Mike Kelly. It was a video work called 100 Reasons. Uh, and we recreated a kind of live performance version of it. Um, the original video was a close-up of Bob Flanagan's ass, uh, Mike Kelly's voice, reading 100 different names for paddles. And ev after every name that he read out, Shree would spank Bob's ass. So all you saw was a kind of close-up of his ass, and then the paddle coming in. <laughs> Um, and the ass getting redder and redder. So, um, we created uh, this short action together, which was, in a way, I thought, like, my chance to address the importance of that history, the importance of that work on my practice. Uh, and Sheree came up to London, and we did it, and that was supposed to be the end. But we kind of fell in love, not in a, you know, a kind of platonic friendship love. And we decided we've got to continue making work together. So over the last 12 years now, we've been making work in which, in some cases, I become a kind of substitute for Bob, in a way, for Cherie to relive, to re-examine things that they've done. But also, we, we make work um, that doesn't necessarily kind of fully speak back to the performances they made, but he's all, always there as a kind of ghost. And I think actually Amelia's written about it and talks about it almost like a three-way collaboration, Shereen, me, and Bob. Um, and I think one of the things about being here in Los Angeles that always makes me think about are those genealogies of art practices and the way batons might be passed on and the ways in which um, our elders might influence our practices, um, and what do we carry with them? What, what do we carry with us from the things passed on by an older generation of artists, artists who passed away? How do we keep their flame burning as well? How do we make work that's not just for us, um, but it's also about thinking about and talking about those artists that who, who might have been marginalized written out of art history, um, forgotten in many ways, and to like, think about our practices of ways of honouring other artists as well. So over these last uh, 12 years we've done 
around 10, 10 different performances together. Um, and many of those have started thinking about death. For the two of us, I said, Cherie is now 81. She had a heart attack a few years ago and is really thinking about like, what does it mean to be facing death as an older woman? And I, of course, am obsessing with, about death, as I always have done. Um, and whereas her practice, she articulates it as her practice with Bob used to be about thinking about his identical death and addressing that through a kind of practice. Now it's about the two of us thinking about um, mortality um, and allowing her a kind of space for thinking about what it means to be dying as well. And so the performance that we are doing on Saturday, which you're all invited to come along to, is um, called Rosie's Wake. And it is her wake while she's still alive. She's always said that she doesn't want a funeral when she dies. And instead, this is her kind of wake. Let's so hear what uh, people have to say about her while she's there. I'll be there in the coffin, listening to what everybody says about me. <laughs> and she says that. <laughs> So coming together to like think about intergenerational modes of collaboration and intergenerational modes of collaboration in thinking of death. Like what does it mean to be young and dying or old and dying? What are the kind of politics of death um, for different kinds of bodies and how they hold that? So there are the ghosts that are kind of here in the space now, Cherie, also the ghosts that have been floating through um, my practice really since, the, since I started it. Bob and Cherie as these kind of figures that are there and central in it and feel like collaborators on the work itself.
Thanks so much, Sean. of the disease to like try and think a little bit more widely around the philosophy of what does it mean to be sick or to be dying. Um, but there is a, a kind of interest from the cystic fibrosis community in the work. And one of the things I always try to think through is how does somebody with cystic fibrosis actually engage with this practice? How can they come to see it? Because they aren't going to come into the room to see the work. Um, and that was a kind of stimulus for me starting to work a little bit more with video, collaborating with video artists, the hell merchants. So when, when we made the Unwell, that was my first thing of like trying to think about how I make something in a form that is actually accessible for people with cystic fibrosis so they don't have to come into the space. Um, so that was a kind of beginning in terms of like practice and making for trying to engage with other people. But it's imperfect because actually, the, for me, the, the thrill of the live audience and breathing the same air as everybody else is the thing that turns me on in an art sense. You know, that's the thing of, of being there with the people, wrestling with the work there in front of everybody. Um, and the immediacy of, of bodies being in the same space, being able to smell the mucus, being able to kind of almost reach out and touch it, breathing the same air as the people in the space. 
and that feels so significant. So it's, it's imperfect, that video is a, is a form to kind of use there. Um, and yeah, so that sort of answers your question in a way. Are we, were you thinking like more yeah, wide? Yeah, I was fucking telling like, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> I think I said that because I have no answer in a way for what do we do, like what's the, how do we connect with people without being in the space is uh, a question which has been going through me for so long and I kind of have all these images of lots of people in bubbles, you know, sort of moving around, bumping into one another, <laughs> big glass bubbles, you know. Yeah, I guess we might be doing that if all these viruses. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> sort of mass prolonging uh -huh. the giant bubble. Um, I mean, perfect, because I have two questions. One is about, I don't think I've ever heard you do a reading. I've read some of your amazing writing. So that prompted the question of kind of what the writing has to do with the performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than that it's a fantastic way of giving the talk. Um, like which comes first, do they come together? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is precisely about kind of what you want from the art space, which you just started talking about. So if you could expand a little about, you know, what it means, not just to be, say, collaborating with Sherry, but to be with an audience of what how you feel them in that space and what you want from us and what you think we're getting from you. Great. Yeah, thanks. Like my first one and then the writing. Um, usually Usually the work kind of starts with an image, um, and the image lingers with me for a long time, and the, the image then starts to trigger many different things. One is usually like some actions that need to happen to activate the image. Others are a series of writings that create it, like a lot of writings come out of those initial images as well. And so that the writing that it does, that I do, so it becomes kind of part of the process of making a work. But often some of those readings find their way into the work as well. They might be recorded and played during the work, or I read them live in the work as well, sometimes. Um, so they find their way, their root is in the, in the process, and then often um, in the work itself. But what's quite uh, interesting, like, the images might often linger for a really, really long time, sometimes years where I think, oh no, I can't create that image. No, I don't, I'm not going to create that image. And it just stays and it stays. It stays like an itch, you know, and you're going, fuck's sake, I can't get it. You know, and then eventually you, you've got to make it. You've got to make that thing that was just sitting there for so long. Um, and then sometimes it's something you don't really want to do. You go, oh, I'm not going to do that, I'll forget it. And it's just sitting there, and it's just sitting there going, hey, don't forget, don't forget. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And then eventually, right, that's the image that's got to be there in the work somehow. Um, and then the second one, I, the second question around this, the people, the audience who are there. I feel like I make it for them, actually. I think that I make the work, certainly not to entertain people, um, but, so, but for, uh, for someone else. Not a particular person, but I kind of imagined other people who were there in the space. Um, simultaneously, is of course, for me as well, but my kind of imagination is that it's for the people that are there in the space with me. And often in these long durational things, there might be moments where there's nobody in the room. There might be moments where there's 300 people uh, and they're coming and going. There might be moments where there's nobody, it's just me, especially at a festival where there's many things going on and everybody leaves and you're in there and I just carry on doing it. And I think, what am I doing? What am I doing? And, you know, in those moments, you're know, like six hours into the performance, your knees are red raw and you're crawling along and you stop and there's nobody in the room. Like, what the fuck are you doing, Martin? What are you doing? And I, we, it was the idea that they're going to come back, you know? If, if I knew they weren't going to come back, you would stop. But the idea that they were back is still for that imagined person who might come in. Um, and, that, you know, that those moments, is, if, if a lot of people are leaving at once, there's something else going on. 
go and see something, they all start leaving. I just feel the kind of anger rising in me. That last person who walks out of the room, they're going to get a nasty stare as they go. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of for them. And it's, I think it's about, about bringing people, it's for them and it's for that connection between me and the people in the space. Because I think it needs them there in the space to make it happen, or at least the imagination that they're coming back to make the work exist. It's a kind of commune, I guess, commune of, of bodies in the space. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Martin. Lexi Justin. We met when I was like day three on the job at Water Archives. Oh, and I'll see you again. Nice to see you. Um, you did such a great job in your lecture tonight of talking about how the pandemic has changed how you approach some of the things that have been so much of a through line of your work, obviously, before pandemic, coughing, sickness, community. Um, but I'm also interested in hearing you talk about the relationship to duration and time that maybe has also changed since the pandemic. So obviously duration is such a part of your practice as well long before the pandemic, but I'm wondering, like uh, everyone's relationship to coughing and sickness and bacteria, if you feel like um, you have a different relationship that time or the community that comes through performances in this mid-pandemic or post-pandemic world has also shifted and thinking about that and the ways that you're working on. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I've always been thinking about duration and the ways in which duration kind of functions in my practice. You know, in, in a weird way, I, I feel, my feelings of it are quite similar than that they always have. Um, I think the work invites people to enter into a space where you can conceive of duration as feeling different and functioning differently. Um, to kind of step out of whatever kind of temporal load you're existing in outside, which could be whatever it is, and to sit into, in a way, my duration. Um, I invite you to kind of sit into the duration of the work, which might be different depending on what the work is, but to saturate yourself in the, in the process of the thing un unfolding. I feel like a lot of the work I make is a kind of process oriented, so people come in, and they observe a process that's taking place and they can dip into that um, and be with the duration of that process. Um, and I really, one thing I really enjoy seeing our audience members either doing like one or two, or two things. One is sleeping, which I always find is a really interesting thing. A lot of people come in and they sit and they stay for six, seven, eight, nine hours in the, in the room without leaving. And they, you know, I see them sleeping and I think, you know, one reaction to that is, well, oh, I'm boring them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and maybe that's the thing and I'm just reading it more generously. Um, but the other way of thinking about it is, oh, if they, they could leave if they wanted, actually, they are choosing to stay in the space and they'll sleep and they'll wake up and they'll watch for another couple of hours and then they'll sleep for another 30 minutes. And like the choice to remain in the space and sleep is quite interesting. I don't want to leave, but I can't sit through everything, but I don't want to leave. I want to be part of this thing. And the second thing is people doing this. <laughs> and that, that is one of my favorite things to see because it's in this way, it's the same thing. I can't watch, but I don't want to leave. I want to be part of this thing, but I, I can't watch as you cough the mucus up and let it slide through your fingers or, you know, working with blood and I'm bleeding. You know, I can't watch, but I want to be here in this space with you. And that always feels like a really beautiful thing to see as the person doing this. Um, and that happens a lot. So yeah, something about like sitting with the process and sticking with the process. Right. Are we done? Yeah, yeah, we're done. Thank you so much.